it up to my colleague to tell us what uh, members of the Liberal Party think. I can tell him because I sit with them and we acknowledge that there is a decline. We acknowledge the importance of supporting French and not only throughout Canada, but also in Quebec. We stated that in the Throne speech. We have stated it publicly. I know that the Bloc is looking for squabbling, but we will always take a stand for French on this side of the House. For Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, CISA says China's communist regime uses spies to intimidate and threaten Chinese Canadians to suppress dissent on Canadian soil. China's Operation Fox Hunt is an attack on Canadian sovereignty and national security. The Prime Minister says he's, quote, long been concerned and that he brings it up when he engages with China. The victims of these bullies sounded the alarm and they have the courage to stand up. So, specifically, what is this government actually doing to protect them? The Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me be very clear that our government has been and will continue to take action to protect Canadians, their personal information and their interests from any threat or intimidation from foreign interference or espionage, including threats to our economy, intellectual property, critical supply chains, and communities. And Mr. Speaker, as the NSI COP report released earlier this year makes very clear, we recognize the hostile activities of state actors, such as China, as a key and growing risk in this regard. Mr. Speaker, we remain constantly vigilant against these risks. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Beyond so-called recognition and all these words, what is the actual action? Almost 80% of Canadians believe China constitutes a threat to Canada. Recently, the Chinese ambassador threatened Canadians in Hong Kong. Canadian citizens are in arbitrary imprisonment and Canadian lives are at risk in China. The Liberals' failure to stand up for human rights and to protect Canadians all over the world is emboldening these state-sponsored bullies. How can Canadians feel safe anywhere? when the Liberals clearly don't have their backs. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the Honourable Member for the question. However, at the very premise of that question is that Canada is making strong representations on an almost daily basis with respect to the issues around China. Reports of harassment and intimidation of individuals in Canada are deeply troubling. Allegations of such acts being carried out by foreign agents are taken very seriously. Chinese representatives of their government in Canada, like all foreign government representatives in Canada, have a duty under international law to respect the laws and regulations of Canada. Canada will continue to use every measure available to us to stand up for Canadians and their rights. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. So just tell Canadians these measures. Canadians are under threat and they deserve action, not just words. Three weeks ago, eight people were charged for intimidating and harassing Chinese Americans in the U.S. American officials say there's an aggressive commitment to protect their citizens from China's campaign of illegally imposing its will. The Prime Minister does admit, as do these ministers, that this is happening to Canadians. So one more time, how many people have actually been charged in Canada for going after Canadians in Operation Fox Hunt. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And let me assure this House that we do not in any way tolerate foreign actors, hostile state actors, threatening Canada's national security or the safety of any of our citizens. And I want to assure this House and all Canadians that our security agencies and law enforcement agencies have the skills and resources and the legal authority that they need to detect investigate and respond to of every such threat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have left thousands of small businesses, especially startups, to fend for themselves throughout the pandemic, and they're desperate for help with a second wave hitting. Many entrepreneurs still can't access SIBA, the wage subsidy, or other small business supports. And now the government is refusing to backdate support for commercial rent relief to April. For months, small businesses have been left behind by government programs, and many now have massive debts and are facing bankruptcy. Will the minister do the right thing and backdate the broken Broken secret program to April 1st to save thousands of small businesses across Canada. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for that really important question. The programs that we have put forward are the lifeline to our small businesses, whether it is the fixed cost support for rent and making sure they have that support today and going forward. 
over 780,000 businesses have taken advantage of the small business loan with more to come as we increased another $20,000. The Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy is providing that necessary help to keep employees on those companies' payroll. This work continues. I'm thrilled to work with all members on every si on all sides of the House to make sure we are supporting Canada's small businesses. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for North Island, Powell River. Well, Mr. Speaker, businesses need retroactive payment. This country is in the grips of the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. In parts of the country, cases are higher than they were in the spring. It is critical that people can stay home to stop the spread of this virus. Instead of supporting Canadians to help save lives, the Prime Minister is now threatening to take away those very supports. Previously, he said that this government would do whatever is necessary to see our country through COVID-19. Can the Prime Minister promise Canadians they will have the financial support that they desperately need to stay home and save lives? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, uh, I thank the member opposite for her concern for Canadians' lives and safety. And in fact, that's what we've been focused on since the beginning. We've been there for provinces and territories, Mr. Speaker, no matter what measures they need, no matter what tools they need, Mr. Speaker, whether it was providing financial support for Canadians to stay home, whether it's support for small businesses and indeed medium and large size businesses to stay viable during this time. And Mr. Speaker, for provinces and territories, $19 billion, as well as additional supports to the Canadian Red Cross and others. I could go on, Mr. Speaker. We will be there for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, many constituents in my riding of Richmond Hill rely on accessible public transit to commute to work and home safely. The proposed Young North Subway extension is a major step in connecting Toronto and York Region. Can, can the Minister kindly update the House on the progress of this infrastructure project and other investments in public transit? Thank you. The Honourable Minister for Infrastructure. I'd like to thank the member for Richmond Hill for his question and for his continued advocacy for the Young North Subway. Our government has invested over $13 billion in public transit, more than 13 times the previous government, while the Conservatives called for cuts to infrastructure. We look forward to working with the province and seeing a business case from them for the Young Subway extension so that we can get it built, creating good jobs, reducing emissions, and helping people get around their communities faster. Here, here. Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, Canada is the only Five Eyes member to neither ban nor restrict the use of Huawei 5G equipment. Why are we allowing the Chinese government to bully and intimidate our country in a brute force attempt to potentially surrender our citizens' data, privacy and security? Mr. Of Industry. Mr. Speaker, uh, we know the potential when it comes to 5G technology and the important impact it will have on Canadians and our economy going forward. That is why we continue to do our due diligence and work with national security experts. We continue to work with our allies. And I can assure the member opposite, we never have and never will compromise when it comes to the safety and well-being of Canadians. And we will make a decision in the best interest of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, the EU's General Data Protection Regulation mandates that all business activities by Huawei meet its requirements. This allowed them to rule that Huawei was in breach of a European privacy law when it failed to comply with the request to provide the data it kept on EU citizens. Can the Minister be clear? Will Canada's Personal Information Protection Act take similar steps to identify companies that are deemed a security threat and take coercive action if needed? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member opposite for his very thoughtful question when it comes to the privacy and protection of individual data when, uh, of Canadians. That is why uh, we've been very clear about presenting the digital charter, uh, which has 10 principles which will guide future legislation and policies and programs that will keep Canadians' privacy and data safe and secure. And I look forward to having a meaningful conversation on the subject matter very soon. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, effective public transit will be key to economic recovery after COVID, and York Region is no exception. The Young Line is at capacity and just doesn't go far enough north. The Young Subway extension would create 60,000 jobs, reduce gridlock, 
and deliver economic growth for the entire GTA. The Ontario government has committed to invest, but this Liberal government is still refusing to act. What is this government waiting for? Why won't they invest in the Young Subway extension? I'm delighted to uh, stand up and talk about our investments in public transit. Our government has invested over $13 billion in public transit. That's more than 13 times what the previous government uh, invested. And the Conservatives actually called for cuts to infrastructure. We look forward to working with the province. We look forward to receiving a business case for the extension so that we can get it built, creating jobs, reducing emissions, and helping people get around their communities faster. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. The federal government says it's committed to public transit in Ontario, but apparently not to the Young Subway extension. The Young line is the lifeblood of the GTA, with 800,000 commuters a day and almost 100,000 of them passing through Finch. For jobs, economic recovery and growth, the GTA needs a union station of the north. The business case is obvious. Why won't the Liberals get this young subway extension on track? What's the real reason they won't invest? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to reiterate again our commitment to public transit. We've invested more than $13 billion, but let's look at the previous Conservative government. They, we invested 13 times more. And what did they call in the last election? They called for cuts to public transit. I'm not sure that they would be committed to the investments in public transit that we so desperately need to make. But we are committed to the Young North Subway extension, but we need to be accountable to taxpayers. We need to see a business case, and then we will move forward because we want to create good jobs. We want to tackle climate change. We want to build more inclusive communities. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, yesterday evening on Tout le monde en parle, the Minister of Heritage said he was hopeful that in the next budget, the web giants would be subject to GST. What we need isn't hope, it's the political will. The minister doesn't have to wait till the next budget. He could simply, as of this afternoon, require Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon et al. to charge GST like everyone else. Even they say they're open to it. The government just has to act. It's, it just has to ask. It's a question of tax fairness. Everybody pays their taxes. When is the minister going to act? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Last week, we tabled a bill that would reform the Broadcasting Act. It's the first time in 30 years. And that act will have significant impacts and advantages for Canadian culture. And our colleagues know this full well because we consulted them repeatedly before the bill was tabled. That will make it possible to add about a billion dollars to allow us to tell our stories in French, in Quebec, in Canada, in English, in Indigenous languages. It's a first in Canada. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Well, we're talking about two different things here because in our conversations we stress the importance of tax fairness, and that is forcing the web giants to collect the GST. Three heritage ministers in a row, all ironically from Quebec, have made this promise. But Quebec's already figured it out. They already charge sales tax on the web giants. The minister is depriving Quebec culture, which has already been hard hit by the pandemic, of hundreds of millions of dollars, while GAFA is making ref record profits. He can require them to collect the GST. Why won't he? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to remind my Honourable Colleague that over $4 billion has been provided to arts and culture since the pandemic hit. According to a recent poll, almost 78% of artists are very happy with what the federal government has done. Of course, we could do more and we will do more. And the broadcasting bill is not aimed at tax. It's a more about broadcasting, but we will continue to make changes to improve the system in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government's announcement on rural broadband last week was too little, too late. Rural small businesses need broadband now, not between 2026 and 2030. This government was late on commercial rent assistance, late on the wage subsidy, and they're busy auditing small businesses in the middle of a pandemic. 
The Prime Minister wants more lockdowns and rural small businesses don't have the infrastructure to move online. Why do small businesses always have to pay the price for this government's COVID responses? Minister. Mr. Speaker, last week we launched phase two of our government's plan to connect every Canadian to high-speed internet. The Universal Broadband Funds builds on our efforts, which we began early on in our first mandate. It's the plan Canadians asked for. It's the plan our rural members of Parliament shaped. It's a plan shaped by expert. It includes flexibility, backbone, last mile, a rapid response stream. I want to thank the Prime Minister for his care and support for rural Canada, and particularly for appointing the member from Long Range Mountains to co-lead this file with me. She truly moves mountains. The Honourable Member for Red Deer Mountain View. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Millions of people in rural communities across Canada lack adequate internet connections. The announcement made by the Liberal governments last week won't change this. One reason is because a large portion of funding is through the Canada Infrastructure Bank, which in three years that Liberal boondoggle has completed zero projects. Why does this Liberal government continue to fail hard-working rural Canadians through smoke and mirror initiatives that get great headlines, but thanks to Liberal incompetence, accomplish nothing? Mr. Speaker, because of our government's efforts, tens of thousands of households at the end of this year will be connected to this essential service. Because of our government's commitment to rural Canadians, we have put more in investments than all previous governments combined. In fact, our government's support in rural broadband is 10 times higher than all governments who have come before us. Mr. Speaker, there is an unusual consensus emerging across the country that every Canadian deserves access to this essential service. Our plan is the plan Canadians ask for. It will work. I encourage colleagues to support their communities to put high-quality applications forward. The Honourable Member for the Bose. Mr. Speaker, in this pandemic, a lot of students in my riding have had to stay home and attend school virtually. They're at a disadvantage simply because they live in a rural area. Chantal Bédard from saint Enidine got in touch with me to talk about her kids' problems connecting to their online classes. From saint Enidine to saint Gédéon in my riding, I keep hearing the same stories. This government loves to re-announce its funding commitments for high-speed internet, but when are they going to release their actual plan to connect people like Ms. Bédard, the Honourable Minister? Mr. Speaker, Women like Chantal have been hit hardest by COVID, and one of the additional responsibilities they bear is supporting their kids with online learning. When that high-speed internet access is not a reliable one, Chantal's life is that much more difficult. We have heard her. We are working to address the challenge. Before the Universal Broadband Fund was launched last week, our government had already invested five times more to connect the people of Quebec than the previous government. We know the work is not done, but there is a program there to support Canadians get connected. I encourage my colleague to work with us to do that. The Honourable Deputy de Moncton. The Honourable Member for Moncton Riverview, Dieppe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was thrilled to hear about the commitment that our government has made towards the creation of a Canada-wide learning and child care system. We also know that help is needed, especially now, to help support parents as they re-enter the labour market. Can the Minister of Families, as Children and Social Development please update this House on the investments being made in New Brunswick to support families through this economic recovery? Bull Minister. Uh, thank the honourable colleague for this question and for continued and effective advocacy on this issue. We know that for uh, Canadians, childcare is not a luxury, it's a necessity. COVID has shown this especially to be true. That's why Minister Hussain was pleased to announce today a $14 million investment to help make childcare more accessible and affordable for New Brunswick.